excited you were able to, <laughs> to join us today uh, for the SMCI lecture series. Um, I'm here to introduce today my um, colleague and friend, Dr. Yokin Prophet, who is the Chief Quality Officer of the, of the California Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative and Professor of Pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine. Um, he received his medical degree from the Albert Ludwigs University in Freiburg, Germany, and he completed his residency at Tufts and dual fellowships in neonatal and perinatal medicine um, and health services research, uh, health services research um, at Harvard, along with the Masters of Public Health at Harvard, and that's where I got to meet Jochen for the first time. Um, his research, which has been federally funded over many years, uh, concentrates on measuring and improving the quality of neonatal and pediatric healthcare delivery, with a focus on enhancing organizational effectiveness, patient safety culture, high reliability, and caregiver resilience, um, all incredibly important and timely topics for us uh, to consider here. Um, as a reminder, you know, our goal at Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement is to help us become the best at getting better. And so we appreciate Yokin's presence here, not only um, because he has created a community of improvers um, throughout CPQCC, um, but also for joining us here at SMCI to share his experience and expertise with us. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Prophet, who will speak about addressing disparities in NICU care today. You might have to unmute. <laughs> okay, I hope you can hear me. We can Thank hear you, you, Grace, for your kind introduction. It's been a couple of years since uh, Grace's wonderful husband, Josh, was an advisor to me uh, way back when. Uh, looking at costs of NICU care in Mexico. So uh, remember those times fondly. Um, yeah, so we'll be we'll be talking a little bit about uh, our perinatal collaboratives. These are statewide collaboratives and uh, what we've done to address disparities in NICU care. Uh, I think my talk's probably going to be around like 35 minutes or so, and it's probably best if we like uh, have discussions afterwards. Uh, but if you have anything really, really urgent uh, to say, feel free to to uh, interrupt and, and we can address things as they, uh, as they come up. Uh, we've been lucky that our like health equity work uh, is currently very well funded. We just actually got notice uh, about uh, a, a project that we find really exciting, which is going to focus on safety net hospitals, um, which we think is really a prime uh, or a key driver to uh, to address uh, disparities uh, for patients here in the state. Uh, just a little bit about our organization. So this is a perinatal collaborative. Uh, it's existed for about 15 uh, plus years. And just in a bit of numbers, uh, we, we really have like a very exciting uh, uh, way to uh, collect perinatal data from mothers uh, two infants all the way out to a high risk infant follow up, and they're a couple of years old. So there's about a 500,000 births, which uh, uh, you know, on which we have information from state data sets. Uh, there's about 17,000 NICU admissions per year, uh, which we for which we now collect data on every single admission. There's about 140 NICUs and maybe 220 or so maternity hospitals uh, that we receive data from. We also track babies. A lot of our babies go from one hospital to another. And uh, so we're really unique uh, in California. We're able to track these uh, babies across hospitals and also track the quality of their transfer. Uh, and then again, about like 9,000 babies who are um, uh, seen in the state's uh, high risk infant follow-up program, which is also one of the few states, uh, except for sort of very small ones that actually have like a sort of statewide uh, network of uh, these programs. And this effort here is led by, and has been led by Susan Hintz uh, with uh, her terrific leadership. So really unique set of data uh, that we have available. What we do is like we use this data essentially to do audit and feedback. We, we get the data, we uh, curate it, and we feed it back to hospitals in order to motivate quality improvement. Uh, this happens either by, by hospitals just reviewing how they're doing and, uh, and deciding on what they want to engage with. There's some state oversight for all the hospitals. The state actually requires 
an annual report on how NICUs do, and uh, this report goes through us. Uh, then we also do quality improvement collaboratives from the IHI style collaboratives, um, and uh, which like bring together like 25 to 30 NICUs. Uh, at the time uh, around certain topics. Uh, we do a lot of education and webinars. We have an annual conference um, and uh, we use the data to also uh, um, do quality improvement research, uh, either evaluating our collaboratives or, or epidemiologic uh, work, et cetera. Um, so this is just a brief overview. This is kind of like what a dashboard of our uh, initial uh, data uh, feedback looks like. So an individual NICU can kind of evaluate how they're doing on their small babies or large babies with regard to like there's infection control data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of little icons and they can click for more. They can click for more detail on any of these and kind of drill down uh, uh, into a number of subsubjects. Uh, these are called improvement collaboratives, which are sort of relatively large. Uh, collaboratives, about seven now uh, since the beginning. They last about 18 months, have a, a, a six-month sustainability period uh, attached to them, and uh, we've essentially published uh, all of them, and all of them have had some success, but as all uh, collaboratives uh, or people who run collaboratives will tell you, there's always going to be some hospitals that are really great on improvement and others uh, that uh, don't accomplish that. And so it's been a longstanding interest of ours to also understand why why that is. Uh, next year, based on uh, based on the funding that just came in from uh, NIH, we'll start a uh, collaborative just uh, focused on our safety net NICUs. Um, the clinical effort will will uh, revolve around breast milk feeding, uh, but really the idea there is to better understand these hospitals and their needs and how they perform under low, low resource uh, conditions. Um, this is one of the things we do. We develop these toolkits on a number of different uh, different clinical topics. Uh, we get over 100 hours uh, of uh, volunteer work from providers from across the state uh, uh, every month, and they look through all of these uh, you know, different different topics and uh, and uh, kind of help guide our improvement work um, and uh, kind of drive it forward to keep us honest. Uh, here's just some some examples from the improvement work that we've done. There's been we've done some on antibiotic stewardship, uh, which has led to almost twelve thousand fewer antibiotic days. I know Grace is going to be excited about that. Uh, and uh, you know we've had things about like delivery room management, uh, for hypothermia, intubation, surfactant. Not all of you are neonatologists. You're probably not all that uh, excited about the details here. But uh, anyways, a number of different topics. The topics are always selected by our members. So we don't kind of, uh, you know, we don't force them into certain things, but uh, they suggest what they want to work on. And we have a formal process to then select uh, from the suggestions. Uh, here's an example of our, of our annual conference. There's been an effort to uh, look at uh, uh, health equity really uh, for many years now, pre-pandemic. Uh, but, um, you know, this is uh, essentially here, we spend like an entire day uh, focused on, on specific topics, bring all the teams together that, that uh, are, are undertaking an improvement collaborative and, and uh, kind of work with them uh, in, a, in a sort of personal setting. Uh, this is just an example of the research, the epidemiologic research, there's quality measurement, um, um, so you know, uh, evaluation of ongoing collaboratives, et cetera, et cetera. We also have a research committee. Uh, members from across the state uh, are, are represented there, and uh, and so they help evaluate uh, what's kind of going on in the collaboratives, or or maybe with other data that we're collecting. Um, and we've been remarkably successful. Of course, it's not a randomized trial, so it might not be only us. There might be other things happening, of course, in the state, but over the last, sort of last 10, 10 to 12 years or so, as you can see, as in 2008, uh, this is just a selection. We've made a number of, uh, of improvements in, in many clinical areas uh, beyond the ones that you see here. We have about a 50% reduction in healthcare-associated infection, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, Necrotizing in a colitis, even though it's still like the bane of our existence, is down to by almost 50% with efforts on breast milk feeding, et cetera. Uh, mortality for BLW infants has been markedly reduced. 
in the in like other comorbidities and multiple morbidities. Actually, multiple morbidities for these tiny babies have been reduced by almost forty percent over the uh, past ten years. So we're really kind of proud of of these accomplishments. All right. So the topic today is about disparities. So disparities because we're a quality improvement organization. Like disparities for us is just sort of like one more of these pieces of variation that can can kind of drive. Uh, you know, differences across hospitals. And if we can remove those, we can hopefully over time lead to less variability in care that's delivered sort of across the state. And so disparities uh, have become really a, an, an interest uh, uh, for us uh, for that reason, uh, because we felt like, you know, we can apply the tools that we have uh, and, uh, and make a difference. So you know, before we kind of talk about disparities, I think it's always important to kind of realize uh, that all of us are kind of exposed to biases uh, that, you know, are, that we're all kind of, uh, you know, daily living in our lives. And so, you know, we see a picture like this and, and many of us might actually have like different interpretations of what this means, right? And um, And it's just because we're you know, we don't live in a vacuum, or, or as uh, Paul Wise kind of mentioned, like when I see the picture up here, like in a cocoon, right? Uh, we all bring bring the biases that we experience, or that we that we're bombarded with, uh, to our work, uh, and we interpret uh, our, our our lives uh, with those biases. So it's important to keep that in mind as you as you think about disparities. Now, these things are insidious. Uh, and they're not, you know, they're not always like maybe on Twitter or something where it seems like very obvious, like what kind of, uh, you know, maybe opinions people have. But you can find these biases in areas like, like, uh, you know, like Google. I mean, if you, if you, this is like a number of years ago, they've responded to this now. I haven't really checked very recently, but a couple of years ago, if you, if you entered like three black teenagers into Google, you would get these sort of uh, really mugshot looking pictures, right? And if you enter three white teenagers, you get these sort of happy-go-lucky ball playing uh, teenagers. So very different, right? And so like in, in places where you don't expect it, you may have these uh, may have these biases. So so you know when we started kind of our journey thinking about the NICU, it was always like, well, it's the NICU kind of like a cocoon, you know, where we can just kind of keep all this bias out, and we just provide sort of the best care to every baby. Or, you know, is it not because we are constantly bombarded with these things and, and uh, you know, and it uh, has an impact. So when we thought about uh, our work, this is kind of like think uh, like how we try to think about it here, frameworks so or social determinants of health. And it's like this is everything from transportation and income and like housing, uh, access to healthy foods and education. Uh, uh, equal rights and, and, and the ability for, you know, to play and, and have like leisure activities. Uh, this, has an, this has an effect during pregnancy on the fetus, right? So what you're exposed to uh, has a major effect and, uh, and actually leads to substantially higher uh, preterm birth rates amongst uh, 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 Black women. And so, uh, you know, the baby is born now what's happening in the hospital here? Are we able to kind of, you know, like come out with these like healthy looking babies for these preemies? Uh, or do we, are we able to narrow a disparity that exists? Or are we just, you know, are we able to at least keep things constant uh, between, uh, between uh, different uh, population groups? Um, the other thing that we've usually not done well in neonatology is kind of like, you know, what happens after discharge? So these babies go back into these communities where they have all these challenges and, you know, what's our role in actually following through, which is why it's so important to have like high risk infant follow up, uh, like integrated into, into the thing, uh, everything that we do. So initially, when we started started out on this road, there was really debate, I think, in the in our community whether or not there was actually disparities in in care. Like you know, it's sort of like well, we treat everyone the same. Like we don't you know make any difference. We like just go from bedside to bedside. We round on these babies, and uh, you know, like we just kind of do what we do sort of medically. Uh, and so we looked in the literature, did a systematic review and used a kind of a quality improvement approach to kind of, uh, uh, you know, fit, fit uh, results into either care structure, care processes and care outcomes. If you're in quality improvement, you recognize this as a obedience quality framework. 
Um, and essentially, we found not very much in the literature, but but uh, certainly, you know, like a, like every kind of part of the quality journey was had had been kind of commented on, uh, either kind of structurally how care is set up for for patients, the processes of care, which should you know be under the under the control of the providers in many ways, uh, as well as the outcomes of care, which sometimes tend not to be under like like under complete control of the providers and so there's always a lot of debate on these outcomes well how much is really our care leading to disparities and how much is just like all the you know prenatal uh programming of the baby that's kind of leading to these outcomes later on uh but you know definitely here within the processes of care there there should be ways for us to uh to really make ensure that there's no uh there's no uneven care being provided all right, now, now that we sort of found some disparities in care like already reported in the literature, what might be the mechanisms uh, in which um, these disparities become apparent? And there's kind of two main pathways. Uh, Elizabeth Howell has written very elegantly about this. Um, the way to think about this maybe is, is kind of between NICU or hospital disparity, and another one is within hospital disparity. So between essentially means segregation of patients into lower performing hospitals. And, and here kind of the main, the main kind of target hospitals for that are, are kind of what we you know, understand as kind of safety net hospitals. Hospitals are typically under-resourced, taking care of vulnerable populations. And the other pathway would be like, would be we, uh, receiving different care within a given hospital. So here's a baby at Stanford, and because they are, uh, you know, maybe Hispanic, they don't, uh, uh, maybe don't speak English, they, they get like less updates, uh, less education, you know, less ability to interact with their patient, et cetera, and with their baby, et cetera. Uh, so that you know that could be an example of a within NICU acute despair. And I'll show you some examples from the literature. So here's actually Elizabeth Howell's uh, work. Uh, this is when she was in New York City. Every dot here represents a NICU in New York City, and this is kind of a composite indicator of morbidity and mortality uh, for VLBW infants. And so here's like the best ranked hospital, and here's like the the worst ranked hospital. And you can see there's a wide, there's wide variation here, but like you know, the interesting part here was that actually like 40% of the black white disparity and 30% of the Hispanic white disparity was just explained by birth hospitals. So where the baby was born made a big difference of, uh, uh, in terms of their, their outcome, morbidity and mortality. We've kind of shown similar things. It's not as, not as, uh, um, strong, I guess, in terms of the uh, the effect size. Uh, but we've also shown uh, a lot of variation in uh, in California. So these are all California hospitals, each of these lines. Uh, they're measured on a composite indicator that we call baby monitor. They're sort of a bunch of uh, metrics that uh, expert panels have associated with uh, quality of care. So it's antenatal steroids, pneumothorax, hypothermia uh, on admission, whether or not the baby gets a timely eye exam, infections, chronic lung disease, breast milk feeding at discharge, growth velocity, and survival. So these, these things uh, can, are combined, and essentially the further out you're here and the further out you're, you're up there, the better uh, a hospital and the better an individual race ethnicity is doing. And so you can see a lot of, a lot of differences Overall, essentially, we found sort of a slight benefit for for Asian and uh, and, and white infants uh, compared to to black infants, um, and and some like more stronger uh, disadvantages for Hispanic infants. And you can sort of see this, like you know, the the like you see a lot of kind of like Asian triangles sort of on the top. But there's differences, right? So there's it's not always the same. There's some hospitals here. Where the black babies do better than than others, um, and uh, you know, so it's like the picture is is not uniform. It's not just a sort of simple uh, simple uh, picture. Um, here we looked at at uh, disparities between hospitals, and essentially the upshot of this was to was to look at infection rates across sort of tertiles of. Uh, uh, Nick use and by race ethnicity and and uh, here like essentially black infants were more likely to be cared for in hospitals 
that also had just in general like higher healthcare associated infection rates. And but Hispanics ended up having just more likely to, to have uh, infections no matter kind of what hospital they were uh, they were uh, uh, being taken care of. Here's an example from Stanford. Uh, uh, so, you know, we have some of our own, it's not just like statewide things, we have some own, our own dirty laundry uh, here. Uh, here's a, a paper from Brignoni Perez. Essentially, this is looking at, at access to skin to skin care, which is really important in neonatal care, like the ability for parents to hold their baby, have multiple benefits for the baby with this. Now, if you don't speak English, uh, you only get to spend about uh, half of the time as it's called kangaroo kangaroo care, skin to skin care, and this is adjusted for you know frequency of visitation, et cetera, et cetera. It turns out that a lot of non English speaking uh, families tend to uh, tend to visit at nighttime, and so uh, you know it might be that our night staff is just not as in tuned in in thinking about uh, like uh, offering skin to skin care, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, but you know certainly shows you that there's opportunity for improvement, uh, even in a place like ours. Um, this is kind of a little bit a, a slide that's that's uh, might be a little, uh, I guess, sort of controversial. I like to show it anyways. But uh, I think there's actually been, there's been quite a bit of progress. You know, I think it's worthwhile also mentioning that. So while overall, and I showed you like 45% improvement in neck rates right early on, like while overall, a lot of our quality improvement indicators have improved. We've also seen a narrowing of the uh, uh, racial ethnic gap, at least here in California. And so we've, like, these are essentially data on necrotizing and colitis from multiple data sources. Uh, Greg Goldstein was like one of our fellows here. He published something here. This is California data. And you can see like, overall decreasing rates of, uh, of necrotizing and colitis and increasing um, increasing uh, breast milk use. And you, know, you can see sort of a slight narrowing here with benefits for everyone. This is Vermont Oxford data. This is data from essentially the entire country, like 90% of all NICUs uh, submit data to Vermont Oxford. And you know, here's a non-Hispanic black uh, rate over the years and the Hispanic rate over the years compared to non-Hispanic white. So slight, slight narrowing here of the gap. And uh, this is data from, from uh, the NICHD research network. This is just 16, 16 hospitals, uh, academic hospitals across the country. So maybe some narrowing here for Hispanics, non-Hispanic uh, whites, but uh, maybe no narrowing here for non-Hispanic blacks, although maybe some slight improvement. But even when we look at across like a number of, of uh, quality indicators, we can kind of see a similar narrowing uh, compared to this. So uh, again, like I, I mentioned this earlier, you know, we treat everyone the same, right? So when I give a talk like this, and like there's always somebody who's like completely offended uh, in the audience. Um, uh, because they they do feel like they don't really make differences according to you know race ethnicity and how they provide care and so we we did a qualitative study at one of these conferences where we asked people to to submit us uh, stories about disparities that they had witnessed uh, in their unit and so this was all kinds of providers physicians nurses nurse practitioners parents also and essentially we asked them you know what you know what was the main uh, what, what is the story about. Um, and uh, you know, language barriers was actually the most common. Like race ethnicity was was me. I think there's like orange, like orange one here, but a number of other things like immigration and sexual orientation, all these kind of things are being understood as, as sort of disparity. And then we kind of sorted these like through qualitative analysis. Krista Sigurdsson was one of our postdocs here. She kind of sorted these uh, stories according to like different types of disparate care. And you can kind of see here is like three main buckets. There's a small Kind of bucket that leads to privileged care, which I also think is interesting, but let's just kind of focus on these uh, like buckets that lead to suboptimal care. So this was neglectful care where staff either ignore, avoid, or neglect family needs, like breast milk feeding support when that's just considered too difficult or unpleasant and obstacles are considered too great to overcome. Judgmental care is also, I think, maybe something that we might have all experienced where staff evaluates a family's moral status based on race or class, immigration, and then circumstances are judged more harshly 
when discrimination uh, occurs through staff attitudes or resource allocation. Finally, is the systemic barriers where staff is either unable or unwilling to address uh, family barriers such as transportation, childcare, housing, employment, uh, translation needs, or religious or cultural needs. And I'll show you just uh, just two of these uh, these stories. Uh, and uh, you know, if any of you is really interested in this, there's a there's a, just a wonderful uh, appendix to this paper that lists all the different stories. Uh, and uh, you know, if you've been in practice long enough, I feel like even if you're not in neonatology, you'll, you'll find almost all these themes have occur occurred during your uh, career. So here's one, uh, I think this is uh, from a charge nurse, uh, just a general observation when I worked as a charge nurse, nurses tended to just ignore parents who did not speak their language. Uh, often the use of a translator did not occur daily for education and updates. These parents would have to sit by the baby's bedside and wonder how they were doing. These parents did not get the opportunity to interact and bond with their baby as a result. Um, here's another story on judgmental care. I see this all the time. The way we treat black moms is definitely different than how we treat white moms. Age plays a factor too. Young moms are judged very unfairly. One black mom was judged very harshly for being late for a feeding, even though she had a long and challenging transit ride to get to the hospital. A white mother who was late on the same day was greeted with sympathy. So I hope this kind of gives you a sense of the, the you know, kind of story that like within hospital, like, like you know, this is what you want in this class. Um, I'll just keep going. So importantly, though, I think the, like all of the, from all the 300 stories we got, like none of them actually said like, here, yeah, we're actually treating the baby differently. It was always like how we treat the families. Uh, so, um, you know, so I think that has ramifications for what we want to do if we if we're trying to address disparities. And so here's what we're doing at CPQCC. So uh, in terms, I showed you the four things that we do, right? So the first one, benchmarking, audit, and feedback, quality measurement. So really, what we're trying to focus on here is a family-centered care pilot. We need to measure family-centered care because this is how you know how it actually happens. And currently, we don't have any direct feedback. Uh, from families or ability to like, get direct family feedback. Uh, what we're trying to do is get like indirect metrics of, uh, of family-centered care. And I'll show you some of the outcomes of that. We developed a health equity dashboard. So now uh, all of our NICUs uh, and maternity units can uh, directly see their results by race, ethnicity, and we kind of flag for them if there's a concern. Uh, with regard to quality improvement, uh, we've We've had a health equity committee now for several years, uh, and it's uh, trying to address uh, both of this interpersonal racism within NICUs as well as structural racism um, through the like safety net R01 that I'm showing you. I'll show you some examples of that. Um, the, we will lead this like collaborative of uh, safety net NICUs. Uh, we also just use an equity aim in our quality improvement collaboratives, and we feed back data to, to hospitals by race, ethnicity, and soon also uh, by language, uh, primary language, so that we uh, can better understand how to, how to guide our quality improvement work. And then uh, finally, education. We've had like a number of these educational uh, efforts over the years on, on health equity, anti-racism, bias training, et cetera. Um, uh, and then we've uh, put out disparity tip sheets. This has been informed by, by uh, families uh, who've been working with us to kind of develop these. So we try to involve the families strongly in all of our work. All of our QI collaboratives, every team brings a family uh, to collaborative meetings. Um, and then finally, with regard to research, we've uh, had several efforts, uh, have several efforts underway. Uh, one of them in uh, uh, focusing also on uh, our uh, Asian um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander uh, groups, uh, which uh, uh, has been sort of an understudied group really in, in the space. And there's a, we may not have time to go into that today, but there's a lot of variation across that group. All right, so here, it's more like uh, audit feedback measuring family-centered care. We essentially developed metrics for family-centered uh, care using expert panelists. We also used families. We trained families to interview uh, NICU families uh, uh, to give us feedback on all of the different metrics. And we revised metrics, got new ones based on all that feedback and re-measured re them. Um, you know, this is now published and we started a a family-centered care pilot. One of the metrics uh, 
that we uh, th that came out of this effort is uh, the days to first kangaroo care skin the skin care I showed you this before. Here's like 21 hospitals are working on this, and you can kind of see like so. This is the first day when when really like usually typically the mother will hold her baby, and you know this ranges from just like essentially the first day of life to all the way up to like almost day 25 here. Um, so a lot of very variation in that, and we're working with this group to kind of address this and, and improve. And there's a couple of other metrics. We developed a whole focus board for these NICUs, and so they can kind of look into, into details on, on, on how things are going um, based on our website. Here's an example, the example of our health equity dashboard. Uh, here's a number of, of uh, clinical outcomes or, or, or process measures. We showed them both. Uh, and uh, they can see the like you know what kind of population they're taken care of, and they can kind of see on on each on each outcome that they click on, they can kind of see the distribution and uh, uh, the top performing group and the bottom performing group, and um, like use this to kind of motivate improvement locally. And uh, so here are some of the other efforts. Uh, CMQCC is engaged in a number of uh, health equity efforts related to, to pregnancy and respectful care of uh, patients. Uh, our groups have been focused on just interpersonal structural racism, uh, language uh, uh, toolkits, um, and transition to home. This is a vulnerable transition for many families and then higher skin from follow-up. Um, all, obviously, this has all been impacted by the pandemic over the past couple of years and transitioning to telehealth, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of work uh, being done in that space. Uh, here's just an example of a disparities tip sheet and an organization change framework that we uh, developed uh, based on sort of systemic learning, institutional readiness, recognition and response. Um, we've kind of published uh, this uh, relatively recently. And, uh, you know, so like, I don't think we have enough time, we can go into this more in detail if you, if you'd like to, to but, uh, you know, these are just some suggestions sort of to get started for hospitals. Um, this has been an active topic in our uh, literature. Um, Jeffrey Horbar from Vermont Oxford and Elizabeth Howell, I mentioned her before, uh, have, uh, have published a sort of summary paper with uh, over more like over seven, you know, seventy suggestions on on how one could get started in addressing disparities in the NICU. So it's not just us; it's also other folks in the in the country. Uh, I thought I'll speak just a little bit about research because you know, what are we going to do? What's going to help uh, in this space in health equity? Uh, in the you know the debate that often comes up for us, it's like, is it like just technical improvement is quality improvement actually health equity work? I actually think it is in many ways. Or does it require like do we require like big adaptive changes, uh, programs to change how people think uh, about uh, caring for their patients? Um, the answer is probably a bit of both as usual. But um, nevertheless, so here's a here's a. Uh, um, example from one of our maternal collaboratives. This was a collaborative on severe maternal morbidity. Uh, the main component of uh, severe maternal morbidity, which is a composite indicator, the main component here is hemorrhage, maternal hemorrhage. And um, uh, as you could see here, sort of before the collaborative, there was a big difference here uh, with black women being much more uh, impacted here by severe maternal morbidity. Now the collaborative actually had no equity focus whatsoever, all of this analysis was done kind of post hoc. The collaborative was really about kind of care standardization, making sure there's hemorrhage cards available, uh, measuring you know, blood output, et cetera, et cetera, sort of having a structured approach, just classic quality improvement approach, technical approach to, to uh, improvement. And at the end of the collaborative, you could kind of see like substantial, you know, narrowing of, of this uh, racial ethnic gap. Like it's just barely significant, uh, you know, if at all. But um, uh, so yeah, so here's you know, and and I think we've seen this over the years in many areas. This is what why I kind of mentioned like you know things are kind of getting better in neonatology. It's like because I think this quality improvement and standardization kind of takes the decisions, you know, that might be laced with bias out of the provider's hands and just makes people kind of do the right thing in a standardized way. 
Uh, here's a, just kind of a, a brain teaser also about a safety net NICUs. You might think like, oh, these NICUs should really be impacted. They're probably like really like kind of sort of poor performers, quote unquote, in the state when we measure their quality because, you know, they don't have a lot of resources. Uh, and and uh, they're, they're the population they take care of tend to be sort of high risk um, and you know, with poverty and uh, and so it turns out, though, that like when compared to all of our other kind of hospitals uh, here using the baby monitor that I told you before, and here's like a metric of survival without major morbidity, what you can kind of see all of these little red triangles are safety net hospitals, and uh, they're kind of all over the map. Essentially, here, here are a couple that are like, you know, number three and four in the state. You know, here's one that's sort of the last one in the state. Overall, there's maybe a slight shift of the distribution to lower performance, but it's very small. And, uh, and kind of here, so, you know, this is sort of kind of a quality composite metric, and here's kind of like an outcomes composite metric. So this is survival without any of the three letter things in neonatology that we're worried about, like IVH and hemorrhage and chronic lung disease, CLD and necrotizing and colitis, et cetera, et cetera, HAI for infections, all of these kind of combined major morbidity is again like a widespread and actually if we took this kind of like outlier hospital out there'd be like no difference at all between safety net and non-safety net hospitals uh, in this is in California so like really our grant and part is, is about trying to figure out you know what is driving some of the hospitals to be here versus others that are kind of more here all right so just in summary just to wrap up uh, we don't practice in a social cocoon. Uh, there is institutional interpersonal racism in the NICU, uh, and we just you know kind of need to get over it. Uh, we don't treat everybody the same, and we just need to like address it and fix it. Uh, to me, education is necessary, but maybe not sufficient. I think we can have trust in some of our QI methods. I think they they are uh, powerful and uh, effective. Uh, and we need to always listen to our families because they know they know best and they can tell us what we should be working on next. And so, yeah, I encourage everybody in other divisions to just try something tomorrow. Um, like I've given you some some of the literature in the NICU. Like I'm sure you know lo a lot of this can be translated to other uh, areas uh, in pediatrics. So I'll I think I'll leave it at that and just say thank you for allowing me to present today. Thank you so much, Joachim. That was um, outstanding. You're getting virtual applause. <laughs> um, the downside of not being in the same room together. Uh, this uh, presentation is now open for any questions um, that feel free to either raise your hand or feel if you prefer, put it in the meeting chat and we're happy to read it out. Um, I did want to start out by asking, so first of all, I, the work that you presented was fantastic, Yogan, and just in terms of um, uh, the story that you told around how you uh, uh, approach both quality and health equity, and you're able to do so in a very systematic and comprehensive way. Um, one of the um, challenges and opportunities uh, for us continues to be sort of understanding at a meta level, um, and you talked a little bit about understanding variability, like why are there some outliers in either direction, um, and learning from those outliers, which I think is going to be extremely valuable. Um, the other aspect of it is a time aspect and thinking about uh, which units are able to sustain the change that they've achieved. Um, so if you compare units, are there certain um, readiness characteristics that you think would be useful to learn from in terms of where units are able to not only make change, but actually sustain that change over a prolonged period of time? Yeah, that's a great question. So we've had, you know, my other interest has been sort of like provider wellness and uh, safety culture, teamwork culture, those kind of things. Part of that is kind of a, a QI culture, like QI readiness culture. And, uh, and so when we do our collaboratives, we actually survey our NICUs now at the beginning of each collaborative and kind of ask them uh, about, about these domains. And so these cultural domains and the QI readiness is kind of part of it. Uh, burnout is part of it. Uh, and burnout, of course, has been just reaching sort of, you know, it used to be a, like, I don't know, epidemic levels before the pandemic and now maybe it's pandemic levels 
Um, we've like it used to be around in the NICU around 25% or so of providers would say that they are severely burned out before the pandemic, uh, and now it's about two thirds. So um, you know, you whenever you do quality improvement, you have to have a workforce that that is uh, you know able to to do it. And so uh, we, what we do is like we use this data and then from the beginning of the collaboratives, and then we, uh, we actually recommend to units to do certain things maybe first uh, before they get going with the coll uh, collaborative, or at least like concomitantly uh, do something else just for the staff so that they can be ready. Uh, and then, you know, we have sort of for sustainability, of course, we like use all the kind of things to try to like hardwire things into the regular system there and, and, you know, not just have things kind of happen for like 12 months while we're watching and then make it go away, which is also why we use like our six month sustainability period where we really don't, where they, they continue to provide us with data, but we don't really have any more interventions. Um, yeah, so it, it takes time. I think, uh, at least what Nick, what uh, units need kind of is strong leadership, like, and that's nursing leadership and physician leadership, at least physician leadership needs to be engaged. Um, you know, even if they're not driving the bus, kind of say like they need to support it. Like if they, if the physicians don't care or kind of sabotage the improvement efforts, it, it's not going to work typically. Uh, and so, yeah, so it, I guess it's a mix out of leadership, um, readiness, like, like, uh, um, you know, and, uh, and starting somewhere where you can show results relatively easy and celebrate those uh, to kind of keep momentum going. Um, that's kind of how we think about our, we think about our collaboratives mostly as, as, capacity building you know these NICUs are all going to do other things over time so for us per, or for me personally like the clinical topic doesn't really matter at all it's like it's all about can we teach them how to do this and then kind of you know have them do it you know in the future either by themselves or come back and learn to do it better and maybe teach others thank you thanks for that uh, comprehensive answer other questions from folks in the chat or want to raise their hands? Dang, I've answered Kathy. everything. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, Caddy, I think you're still muted. Double muted. <laughs> yeah, double mute. It's the, it's the dreaded double mute. Um, hi, Katie Brown Johnson with the Evaluation Sciences Unit. Um, Dr. Pavit, this is such a great talk. Um, I, I, I love the QI. You, you and I just chatted last week about quality improvements and, and qualitative methods. So, you know, I'm on board with this. And I'm, I love that this is a collaborative, um, you know, a, across institutions. And I'm curious, you know, at the next level, at the national or international level, how do you see this fitting in to even larger initiatives? Um, and I know there's baby friendly hospital stuff going on. There, there um, I'm sure there are other really large um, QI and, um, and quality initiatives. And I'm, I'm, I'm just curious to have you reflect on those how helpful are they? How much do they get in the way? And, and where does this work fit in with that? Yeah, thank you, Katie. Um, I think actually, like I often think about it in going two ways. I feel like we could go smaller in, in that. I think we actually could, could do something like across divisions at Stanford. You know, it's like, why? Like, and, you know, we'd have to find a topic like infections or something and, you know, clinical topic that like is relevant to a number of units. Uh, I think one of the biggest benefits you derive out of these, these collaboratives is kind of just sort of the enthusiasm that people gain when they work together with other folks on a problem. And, uh, and so it can't just be like, I think to me, like, like, you know, the most important part there is actually like face-to-face -face meetings and celebrations. You know, when we're like, uh, there's, there's something, you know, the Vermont Oxford network, which is kind of like a larger 
actually an international nerd work that maybe which does it at a like to get to your question also like does it at a national and international level like the most important part of i think all of these effort their efforts was always just their you know their social at their annual meeting where you know they would always have a theme and people would dress up and they would dance and they would like all kinds of things and they would go to karaoke together and uh, you know the the kind of enthusiasm and and uh, and renewal of energy you would get from um, from participants there was really unmatched with anything that I've seen sort of in medicine. And I think this this, this kind of enthusiasm is really what what drives the improvement more than any of the technical things that you know we make people do. Like we you know we have our we have our best practices or potentially better practices, how we call them, and our, our change packages and all that kind of stuff. But I think that that is all, only a small part of the actual improvement journey. It's really all in the kind of enthusiasm of the staff and the like, commitment that they bring, the engagement that they bring to it. So yeah, so internationally, like I, like I think the, the, the last thing I was going to say about that is, I think it's really important to understand that like we are a bottom up organization because uh, so some of the international experience that I've had with uh, like WHO trying to do some of these things in, in uh, like Africa and India uh, is very top down and very much like we're going to measure how you do and if you don't do well then we're going to punish you. Uh, kind of approach is, is I think, doomed. Uh, so I think the reason why this works is because providers intrinsically want to kind of do the right thing for their patients. And if you harness that enthusiasm, uh, we can really get the improvement. But uh, if you do it internationally, I think, especially in like sort of middle income, low income settings, like you, you can't forget that it really should be coming from the bottom, not from the top. Thank you. And I just have to say, I'm impressed that you get that many volunteers to contribute to CPQCC. That's a ton of volunteer hours that are coming in just to support improvement across all the NICUs. Michael? Hi, Michael Rothman from the Dean's Office in the School of Medicine. The question on the last slide you showed about the improvement work of, go of closing disparities by moving towards standard processes more explicit intentional processes in the NICU as as what you thought was the the key driver of that do you do you see NICU care as maybe being a different case and do you think the same strategy of standard work standard processes taking um I might say the unconscious biases away by giving these indicators for standard process and work is that yeah. different in NICU care or could that be a strategy that will be consistently successful in other areas, hospital outpatient care? Um, so I haven't given as much thought to outpatient care. I'm not, I'm not I wouldn't want to answer for that, but um, I don't think there's anything specific to the NICU in this, you know, and with regard to biases. Um, like I, you know, I, I think, well, I guess there's two, like, I don't think just technical improvement will work for everything. I think there's some areas in the interpersonal realm where you need to have like an adaptive learning approach and, you know, sort of educational approach. That's, that's clearly part of the improvement, but there's a lot of, I think there's nothing specific about the NICU that would would you know and this was a maternal collaborative but there's nothing specific about our space that would set it apart i think from uh from other areas of medicine um, where just standard work will will you know improve um disparities in care delivery now it, it won't improve kind of pre-existing disparities you know that that are all within the social determinants of health arena um so you know, you'll 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 be, you'll be left with that part, and uh, and that needs to be addressed as well. But within the care part, I think the standard work can overcome some of the biases or just deem them irrelevant. Like if it doesn't, if you have to do X, Y, and Z, it doesn't matter whether you're biased or not. It's just that's what you're supposed to do, and you know. So, so I think it's effective. Like standard work is effective for those kind of relatively maybe like I've called them lower hanging fruit. Thank you. Other questions? Well, I'm not, well, 
Karen Wayman, I'm calling on you only because I, and I'm going to show my bias here because um, I, number one, appreciate Yoka and your comments and your um, descri uh, description of uh, a family-centered care dashboard and specifically one that is very outcome-driven like kangaroo care, which I, you know, I wasn't thinking of that when you had originally started with the family-centered care dashboard. I had a different dashboard in mind. Um, so uh, I, I really like the idea and the approach that you've taken, which is really to take a patient-centered approach to some of the outcomes that are really important to them. And so, um, Karen, given your deep work and expertise in establishing family-centered care um, at our hospital, I'm just curious, you know, any thoughts or takeaways from your perspective for how we can continue to expand and grow um, what was presented today? Well, we've been having some background chats here, so a lot's going to happen, I think, after your talk. Um, I think what I just, I always think that the way in which you collect data and the discovery process, we so often have providers do surveys or with parents or use interpreters. I think you're getting down to the heart of the matter when you're having parents interview other parents and train to do that. I think that discovery process is something we overlook so often to get to the solutions we're trying to get to. So I, I just think that was part of the, the thoughts that you had in terms of getting to, especially around kangaroo care, because I'm very familiar with the discrepancies in that. I think, um, I'm not, I, I have to think about the standard work and how it closes discrepancies and how if that's, you know, if that doesn't feel family centered to me, but I think in fact, it might be a, a pathway. So I, I think it's worthy of further discussion. So anything when I stop and say, no, that can't be true. I want to talk about it more. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think we shouldn't think about standard care as like cookbook approaches, but it's really, it's like rather the opposite, you know, like we need, need to individualize kind of our standard care. Like, so if we have certain, you know, moms that might be at higher risk for for not, you know, wanting to breastfeed or something like that, like, you know, we need specific kind of pathways to- you know, Address those, You're right. I That that I can yeah. agree, because sometimes I see standard work as smoothing away the differences rather than yeah. addressing the differences, so. Yeah. I love the dynamic and the tension between the two. <laughs> it's a healthy tension that'll keep us honest. Um, I'm surrounded by PI people here. I I can't <laughs> I can't say anything without them overhearing me. <laughs> Any other questions or comments people would like to make? All right. Well, the timing is perfect. I um, I also just wanted to emphasize and thank you, Jochen, for um, uh, uh, you know bringing forward this concept that there is no quality without equity and there is no equity without quality. So um, the two are intertwined, and really uh, being able to uh, frame the conversation um, rooted in some of the principles that are familiar as we um, need to continue to make more visible and address and particular health equity as a core component of the work ahead, I think is um, something that uh, we are embracing as a at Stanford Medicine and look forward to continuing our journey on. So um, this is wonderful. Um, and uh, with that, I'm gonna give everybody five minutes. Um, thank you again, Jochen, for a wonderful talk. Uh, that was really helpful and I think uh, lays the groundwork for us. Uh, and shows us the way ahead. So appreciate all your work on this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Grace.